Now, I would like to invite uh, Professor Geeta Narayana Map, convener of BMESI VIP, to say a few words. Hello, good morning, one and all. Uh, I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, actually, I don't. Uh, this is uh, the first event we are doing for this academic year, and uh, it is a certificate course on medical manufacturing and regulations. So uh, the event is uh, with the blessings of, uh, I should say, blessings of Goddess Saraswati and uh, with the blessings of BMESI India and of course our own uh, Chief Academic Officer Dr. Saurav Mehta who approved the course uh, in two days actually. Uh, so uh, I would like to know none other than uh, Dr. Mehta sir uh, can start the event. So I would like to invite Dr. Saurav Mehta to start the event. Dr. Saurav Mehta is the Chief Academic Officer of Vidyalangar Institute of Technology. He has a vast research experience in the field of electronics and telecommunication engineering. And he is having uh, around 14 years of experience and there are many technical papers, around 70 technical papers published. And he has done his PhD and MS in wireless networks from South Korea. And he is uh, from our own uh, Mumbai University. He did his BTEC B in electronics from Mumbai University. Uh, I welcome sir for uh, starting the function, sir. Dr. Mehta. Thank you, uh, Geeta Madam, for your kind words and uh, thank you everyone. So very good morning one and all. So I'm really happy to see that uh, so many students or a participant actually join right from the beginning. And it is a, you know, uh, generally it is saying when there is a good start, there is always going to be a good end. So it's a very nice uh, initiative that has been taken by biomedical department. I especially would like to thank uh, biomedical department, the leadership team. So our HOD sir, Chitendra sir. And uh, then I just uh, wanted to specially thanks to Gita ma'am. Uh, she's always, uh, you know, very uh, active and try to always make sure that the students should get like, uh, you know, the maximum benefit whatever kind of like you know initiative that she is handling i think she is handling our virtual lab then recently she has also started to looking into the students quality project and uh, this particular like uh, you know the course so thank you geeta madam uh, and uh, the for making this opportunity available to all our students and participants and i also wanted to thank entire biomedical team who are working like you know uh, day in and day out for this uh, course to happen. So I don't know the all the names, but uh, I can see that that entire department has been involved in designing this particular course. And I see majority of the faculty members have also actually joined this particular like a uh, uh, course. So I'm very happy to see that thing. And uh, I think this is a consecutive second uh, big program that I have seen from the biomedical department in the year of 2021. In March 2021, there was a huge conclave uh, in association with Society for Radiation and Research. And uh, that was a huge success. So many doctors actually have joined, uh, not just from India, but also from the abroad. And so many like a participant, uh, they have come uh, not from only Mumbai, but they were like from everywhere. Uh, I think it was a national wide uh, good uh, kind of like a seminar. In fact, not a national wide, it's a global kind of like a seminar where uh, many actually uh, participants came from around the globe. So, and after this uh, uh, in 2021 uh, August, now that we are starting with the two, uh, eight weeks of like a long course, and I'm sure that the students who are uh, going to participate or whomsoever is a participant they will get immense insight from the industry point of view. Generally in academia, we teach the subject, we teach the students about like, you know, the different technology that is actually available to us. But uh, when it comes to real hands-on, real getting the practical insight about it. So that time, you know, our uh, industry uh, mentors or industry speakers are going to be the key part in delivering this particular like, you know, sessions. 
and i am really thankful to all our speakers so all the speakers have actually you know agreed to deliver this course and our speakers are not just restricted only to india i mean they are from abroad also so uh, before i thanks to all our like a speaker i also wanted to mention special thanks to our biomedical student association biomedical engineering society of india and special thanks to biomedical engineering uh, society of india who have actually uh, uh, you know uh, agreed to be a part of this particular initiative and even they have given us some uh, generous grant so that we can make this particular program in a grand scale so i really wanted to thank them and i always uh, uh, believe that uh, collaboration is a key to be the success for this thing so i think we should try to bring as many as collaborator as possible uh, 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 in our academic uh, program so that uh, students always get a good benefit of like academia as well as like a industry and uh, today speaker our first speaker ms shreya kulali she is from penumer uh, company and she is from california so i really wanted to thank her that she is taking time out of her busy schedule i know that there is a huge time difference between india and california but i must say that she is really passionate about like you know uh, 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 teaching and then uh, she is uh, delivering uh, her insight about uh, this particular course to our like a student so i feel that our students and all participants are really uh, lucky to have speakers like this then we also have mr kalpesh patil is a manager at ai and data scientist from michelin from usa so that is again like a, you know the, we have a international speaker with us then uh, third speaker that we have is mr nilesh shinde he is a cto at jupiter hospital so being a so busy at this position i can understand that uh, but taking time and then coming for our course so i just wanted to thank them then we have mr anand panchal he is a program manager at ion so uh, he is also going to deliver a lecture maybe in the fifth week of our course then we have a mr deepak raina he is a journal manager of north and west zone uh, fluke biomedical uh, <coughs> fluke biomedical instrument so if you look at all the speakers all are representing respective industry and uh, all are going to bring lots of insight and their wisdom and their experience uh, to our participants so once again i request all our participant to please take the advantage of this opportunity do this course and i see that there are two special uh, assignment week so please do all the assignments sincerely so that will provide you a you know good opportunity to do some kind of like a hands up and uh, looking at those registration number i was discussing with uh, geeta madam so i am very happy to note that that the nearly like a 300 participant across the india uh, they have registered for this particular course and i am sure that this uh, 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 you know due to some busy schedule or something maybe they will not be available in a live session but uh, i request a biomedical department to record all the session and make those sessions available to all our participants so they can you know take the advantage of this course whenever there is the possibility so it is a wonderful initiative and i think this kind of like a more initiative that we required from uh, every department and even i uh, now my expectation from biomedical is very high that uh, uh, we'll get like a more and more this kind of like you know the uh, initiative uh, from uh, biomedical department so that all our students get uh, maximum benefit for it right so uh, now on behalf of like you know vidya lankar institute of technology and vidya lankar janpit trust i just wanted to once again welcome you all and uh, wanted to wish you all a very happy learning for this entire like eight weeks so have some uh, you know the patience and then utilize this uh, uh, you know opportunity to its fullest so now i'll again hand it over to uh, geeta madam and all the best everyone hello sir shreya ma'am has already joined uh, she is oh, already okay. there in the tv yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah thank you thank madam you. Thank, thank you so you, much for joining with us and uh, taking out uh, i mean taking time out of your busy schedule so thank you so much Absolutely, it is my pleasure, and please don't call me ma'am. Uh, I am way younger than all of you guys who are organizing or, uh, 
you know, in the uh, who's making the efforts to put this together. So please address me, Ashreya. I would be more happy if you do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I think now maybe we can uh, again. I'll uh, hand it over to Geeta, ma'am. So as per the proceeding, now we will uh, proceed further. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Uh, now I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Jitendra Dorvi for briefing about the uh, departmental activities of biomedical engineering. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Geeta, madam, and thank you very much, Saurav Mehta, sir, for a nice introduction for our course. And uh, you are the best person to introduce because you are you are our chief academic officer and vast experience. Uh, in the field of research and you may not be knowing he is also in the field of management also few of you may be knowing he has already already acquired management uh, master's degree and maybe uh, soon he will uh, be a doctorate in management i'm hoping for that and then will we have a dual personality engineering uh, doctorate as well as a management doctorate so uh, it's a right person to introduce our course yeah so i just i will not take much time but i will briefly say that our biomedical engineering department at Vidyalankar started it in the year 2006 uh, with a clear vision that to become a center of excellence in the field of biomedical engineering. And uh, everything is, I think, uh, most of our, uh, what our achievements are there, they are already mentioned in the brochure, but still uh, I want to say that we are NBA accredited and as well as our institute is uh, accredited A plus by NAC. So we have been uh, doubly accredited department and of course we got a very experienced faculty and they are expertise in domain and one more important thing is that we got very intelligent students we got very intelligent students now you must have seen that in the form of committee of bmsa and bmesi all our bright students are there and they are all managing the team so i'm very thankful and i'm very happy about these two teams bmsa and bmesi and i would like to tell them to continue this work in, in future also and come to with some new more ideas and we, we will be successful in achieving our vision. Now, just briefly, I want to just uh, say a few words about why we started this certificate course on the medical device manufacturing and regulation. Because in this pandemic, you must have heard three commonly, you can say instruments which are used here. One may be the IR thermometer, but most important is the, say, uh, a pulse oximeter and third was the oxygenator yeah the three things and of course ventilator was there so all these thing uh, instruments were very useful and what happened in in that period that there were so many manufacturers were there they were promoting their products so it was necessary to assure the standard and quality of the product because it is to be normally used for clinical purposes so suppose pulse oximeter is used one should be damn sure that it is giving the correct value of the SpO2. Similarly, oxygen concentrator they are using, it is necessary that they are giving you the oxygen concentration more than the specified, that may be 90% or something. So there is very important to have regulate this manufacturing as well as the standards. So there are so many standards, European standards are also available, maybe Indian standards are also there. And while manufacturing certain standards are there, even uh, while testing also certain standards are there. So we'd like to introduce all these standards to all our students as well all the participants. I will not go in details of the course because Professor Arun Kumar Ram will tell you about this entire uh, course. But with this uh, brief introduction, uh, I, I welcome you all the participants and uh, please uh, attend all the uh, sessions as well as uh, maybe projects, whatever thing, or maybe assignments also and uh, give us feedback so we can always uh, be there to improve upon. And uh, definitely we, we, this is an attempt to give you a more practical approach for uh, designing the course and as well as the uh, how the devices are manufactured and what are the regulations are there. So with this small, I again welcome you all and again thank all our uh, staff members, Professor Gita Narayan, Madam Arun Kumar Ram sir, Professor Nilam Punjabi and all my colleagues in our department Maita sir, and all our young BMSA and BMSI team for the great work they have done. So with this brief introduction, I hand over the mic to again to Gita Narayan Madam so that she can proceed further. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
thank you sir for your kind words and uh, even i i uh, did not mention in the beginning because it was uh, actually uh, the prompt response from the bmesi and bmsa students uh, was very much important here because we could send the brochure in time to different people and get the sponsorship also because of that only we are we were getting the brochure in time whatever corrections we were telling in no time it was coming back so i have to mention that and uh, thank you all students Uh, now i would like to call upon uh, professor arun kumar for uh, give, briefing about the course professor arun kumar hello is it audible ma'am yes yes uh, good morning all the participants guest speaker ms shreya kulani head of the department dr jitendra tobi chief academic officer dr saurav mehta and uh, all my students and colleagues i warmly welcome you everyone to this certificate course in medical device management and regulation uh, this event is uh, sponsored by biomedical engineering society of india and uh, jointly conducted by the bmesi and bmsa student chapter at vit uh, before we start i would like to give a short introduction to everyone uh, about the society bmesi it's an all india non profit making body which is uh, head headquartered at uh, manipal institute of technology at manipal uh, they have uh, uh, many biomedical students and professionals as its members uh, vit happens to be one of the institutional member of this body since 2011 uh, bmsa is our biomedical students association at vit so both of these uh, student bodies have been very experimental Uh, since 2011 in conducting several workshops and seminar in the past right uh, so briefly about this uh, workshop this workshop is a certificate course of uh, two credits uh, this will include series of uh, webinar and as well as hands on training on latest tool the first four sessions which we have planned in this program it includes uh, the today's talk on uh, medical device manufacturing and regulation Uh, this will be followed by a session a hands on workshop on artificial intelligence and machine learning on 4th september there is also a talk on medical safety which will be scheduled which is scheduled on 24th september and again a hands on workshop on implementing iot based products on 2nd october so the schedule of the sessions the further sessions will be communicated to all the participants in a uh, due course of time as you can see this uh, course is an extensive course which is uh, spread across uh, for the this as well as for the next semester so we have the speakers confirmed for this semester and shortly we'll be sharing the schedule for the speakers who will be there for the next semester also i would like to mention a necessary condition here that uh, to be eligible to get a participation certificate the participants need to attend all the sessions they have to complete all the assignments and as well as submit the feedback so looking at the convenience of all the students we have uh, arranged most of the sessions on weekends so once again i welcome everyone to this program over to the team sir actually uh, we are uh, confirmed with one more speaker that is a fifth session which is coming in the uh, october actually october after the 9th october and if we are able to get uh, one more workshop then we can finish the course this semester itself so that they did not extend to next semester we are trying our level best for that so that it will be completed in one semester i just wanted to add on yeah now uh, back yes. to ananya for uh, starting the session of shreya ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you everyone uh, for your kind words uh, now i would like to welcome our honorable guest speaker mrs shreya kulali ma'am who is a manufacturing engineer at penimra california she is very skilled in project management supply chain management project planning and has knowledge about various programming languages currently she is working on sustainable manufacturing project with an objective to reduce the lead time by doing time study of manufacturing process and increasing the efficiency of the process by improving the machine tooling handing over to shreya ma'am 
I would like to request her to continue this event. Hi, everyone. Um, are you guys able to hear me? You can give me a thumbs up. You don't have to unmute yourself to tell me. Um, everyone, can, awesome. Everyone can do a hand thumbs up. Perfect. Um, thank you for inviting me as the guest speaker. Um, I was not too long ago a student just like you, uh, finishing my bachelor's and then came to US, did my master's, got a job, started working. So um, from the bottom of my heart, I want to tell you, I really miss being in college, being in school, because that's the time when you don't have to worry about anything. Um, you can just, you know, go to school, get your studies, um, you know, get your good grades. And I know being in college or being in school, the first thing you want to do is graduate and get onto a corporate life. But trust me, enjoy each and every day as a student. So once you are in your corporate life, even if you want to go back to school, it becomes a little difficult and tricky. You miss that freedom. Uh, you miss that home cooked food. Um, and you miss your teacher's um, scoldings and all of that assignments and all of that homework, right? Uh, but yes. Um, uh, getting on to the topic, I'm Shreya Kulali. I uh, did my bachelor's in uh, electronics and communications, um, did my master's in industrial and uh, engineering, started working as uh, an industrial engineer for a company called Electronics. We were into electronics and PCB manufacturing. Um, we made control systems for natural gas engines. Um, then I moved on to working for a company called Sartorius and uh, Sartorius made diagnostic medical instruments. That was a very interesting uh, career change, career path change. Uh, and then once I got into medical field, I knew that I wanted to stay here. Any further companies that I would work for were um, representing uh, medical manufacturing or any kind of medical device uh, for that matter. Um, now I'm working for a company called Penumbra, um, headquartered in Alameda, California, and I'm based in Roseville, California, where we have another facility of manufacturing. Um, and then we make catheters for a living. Um, I know when I say catheters, the first thing that comes into your mind is urinary catheters, correct? Um, I know some people are giggling, some people are laughing, some people have smile on their face when I say urinary catheters, but I don't make them. Um, I make catheters that go inside your body that are used by surgeons to take out blood clots. Um, blood clots can happen anywhere in your um, body, right from your brain to your tiny little toe um, on your feet. Um, you need a way to access them. Uh, brain tumors can be accessed by nose. Um, um, I know there is a canal that goes right from your nose to your brain. Uh, I know it sounds scary. Um, I know it sounds impossible, but that's the quickest way. Correct. Or the other way is cutting your skull open in half, uh, tearing apart your brain and accessing uh, the clot, right? But hey, that sounds more scarier. So um, hey, um, quick thing, guys. I know many of y'all had your videos on and I saw you guys dropping out. Um, it is a little weird for me to talk to a blank screen. Um, if you don't mind, you can come back up. Um, uh, yes, I see Gita ma'am come up, right? It, okay, now this is more fun. Now I'm talking to a group of people that can see me and that I can see you guys, correct? Um, it was really awkward. I mean, how do you, I mean, I should really appreciate the teachers and the professors who have um, you know took up this responsibility during COVID times to teach with a black screen I swear I cannot do that so good 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 thank you and hats off to all of the professors that have been doing this for the year and a half right um, thank you guys again I appreciate it so um, where I was talking about catheters so um, opening up your skull opening your brains up tearing it apart sounds more scarier less scarier than having it having a catheter put up your nose to take your blood clot out sounds a less scarier minimal invasive less recovery time correct um where what happens if you have a blood clot in your hands or legs how do you um, access those correct 
uh, there's a jugular vein in your thigh region, uh, in your groin region. Again, I see a little bit smiles the moment I say a little groin word in a thigh region. Um, but that's the, um, I would say, uh, the biggest vein or um, artery that is available to access the cloth. So that's where you can access, put in your catheters uh, to take your blood clots off, correct? Um, I do have a presentation. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll go through the presentation real quick, but giving you a little background of what I currently do. Um, catheters manufacturing is done basically all by hand we have people uh, that we call as product builders they come in every day um, five days a week um, work eight hours a shift day shift swing shift is from three o'clock to eleven o'clock um, and then something called as graveyard shift where people work from night eleven o'clock to morning six o'clock um six to se six thirty six seven o'clock um so people work in three shifts uh, make catheters by hand every single part every single material is assembled by hand uh, why why we don't have automation in something so critical uh, machines are handmade. we cannot 100 percent rely on machines if something goes wrong in machines machines are smart enough um, to either solve the problem by themselves or get stuck. If it gets stuck, your manufacturing comes to a halt. You are looking at a thousands and millions of dollars in losses if the machine just gets shut down for a couple of hours, correct? But humans, uh, if one slows down, we can replace a human by another one and we can keep our manufacturing pace going. Um, if something goes wrong, if a technique of a product builder goes wrong, we can rectify then and there, um, hence controlling the cost, correct? Um, there are a few steps in the manufacturing process that we currently um, try to automate or are already automated, but 90% of the manufacturing of medical devices um, throughout the world are assembled by hand. Yes, a few parts are uh, Maybe 100% of the parts are machine made or manufactured by machines, but when it comes to assembly, it's done by hand, it's done by a human at the end of the day. Um, it's not just about assembly. Um, engineers like me are also uh, um, responsible for quality check. Uh, yes, we have quality engineers as well in place, but a part of uh, a manufacturing engineer is to make sure um, the product qualifies to the specifications mentioned um, in your drawing, in your engineering drawing. Um, to the specifications mentioned when we release the product, that this product is going to work um, so and so, it's going to serve its purpose. Uh, there's tons of validation processes that goes through, tons of verification process that goes through. Um, I know, verification and validation uh, seems like too similar word. Uh, we'll touch base uh, the difference of these two words later in the session. Um, tons of qualifications, uh, tons of clinical trials. Uh, yes, we are uh, at a stage where we don't need a human, a live human to do clinical tests. We do have robots, we do have simulations that mimic a human body. Uh, all the processes inside a human body uh, and we train doctors, we train uh, clinical professionals, we train medical professionals in how to use the product using a dummy. That's what we call it, right? You know, who we, call, we call all of the, probably a robot, but we call it a dummy. It's not a robot, it's a dummy. So, um, so that's where we are at. Um, let me share my screen real quick. Um, do I have the access to share my screen? Uh, thumbs up would also work. Yes, I have. Yes, okay, perfect. So let's try. Um, let me open up. Okay. Let's do this. I want to share a quick video. Uh, of 
OK, you guys see my screen? OK, perfect. I will try if you guys can see the uh, if you can hear the audio, but if not, please forgive me. I'm not tech savvy at all. Can you guys hear the audio? No, ma'am, it's not audible. OK, let me go give a quick check with my device settings. While sharing only, you have to change it. While sharing, you have to put the video on. You unshare and again share it. That time, okay. you, uh, while sharing, there is an option coming. Of uh, turning video, on your system turn. audio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Let's try and do that. Uh, let's try that once again. In the right corner. While sharing, it is the right corner, no? Perfect. I apologize if you were not able to hear the video. It was not just it was nothing but a nice music uh, to the video, but you could see we put in a catheter uh, through the thigh and the groin region all the way up to your nose and to your brain to take the blood clots out. Uh, looks cool. Yes. No. Thumbs up. OK, so this is what I make uh, for a living, right? I get paid to optimize. I get paid to make this process efficient. I get to make sure I get paid to make sure that this quality is at its highest standards. Uh, again, I get paid to make sure whatever product I push out of my uh, company's door um, is used to save a patient's life uh, and not kill the patient, right? And, and exclamation marks, not kill the patient. Um, so this is what I do, and this is what uh, a part of medical manufacturing um, looks like. Uh, the best part of working in a manufacturing field is uh, you only work eight to five or whatever your time is. Uh, you don't get your work home. Uh, unlike uh, people who work in IT, uh, people who work in, uh, I'm going to be a little selfish uh, because I do work in manufacturing, right? Uh, nothing wrong with any other fields. Uh, I have tons of friends, uh, my husband including. Um, oh, by the way, my husband is a graduate from your institute, VIT. Uh, so he graduated long, long, long years ago. And um, Gita ma'am, I see a little smile on Gita ma'am's uh, face. Uh, he knows him. Uh, she knows him. Um, but yes. Um, I see him work long hours. Um, he works for a storage technology company. Um, since manufacturing is a field that you cannot work from home, you cannot get your catheter devices at home. Um, you cannot do a quality check uh, on those devices at home. So the moment you walk out of the door, that's it. 
the only time you get back to work is the next day morning, eight o'clock. That's the best part uh, for me. But uh, what is the most difficult part? I am always on my toes, uh, always on my feet, uh, because the thing on the back of my mind is, if there is a slightest mistake in any of the processes and I don't catch it, someone on the other side might die. And that's a huge um, responsibility on my shoulders when I go to work every single day, correct? But uh, nevertheless, the fun part is I get to talk to people, um, obviously at a safe distance, six feet distance, we have COVID going on outside. So um, making sure I have masks on, I have gloves on, uh, and also when you work with medical manufacturing, we work in something called as clean rooms. Uh, clean rooms are regulated. Uh, you are supposed to wear uh, a bunny suit. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you must have seen uh, these days doctors wear at hospital trying to protect themselves from getting infected from COVID. They have uh, hair nets on, they have two kinds of masks on, they have gloves on, they have this whole bunny suit on that makes sure that you know nothing from outside is going in they have shoes on safety shoes on yes i wear the same attire every day when i go to work uh, because i make something that is going in someone's body a human body uh, i need to make sure that nothing i'm wearing is exposed outside nothing that i'm wearing is contaminating even the even what I'm breathing or breathing out is not contaminating the product I'm making. Uh, now, this is not required for every medical device. Um, we'll talk about the classes of medical devices as well. But um, fun part, right? I get to talk to people. I get to interact with tons of people. I get to know about their culture, their life. I get a chance to make a rapport with them, get to know about their families, if they have kids if they're married, if they're not married, if they're a single mom, single dad taking care of their families. Um, I get to talk to them about all of this. Um, it's fun. I love to talk to people. Uh, that's just who I am, correct? OK, so uh, enough of talking. Let me quickly share my presentation. Um, again, apologies if uh, the presentation is not up to the marks. I know you guys are uh, Gen Zs. You are best at doing everything. Um, one of the, uh, I think one of the professors or I think the HOD sir said, um, you guys are intelligent students, right? I need to appreciate BMESI and BMSA organization. Uh, Sorry, I'm looking at that, looking at down. I, I made a little notes during the introduction, so I don't uh, misread or miss say the names. Um, that's very bad. Um, but um, the changes to the changes to the flyer, uh, changes to everything that you made were super fast. I am never good at multitasking. I do one thing and do my best. Uh, but awesome job, guys. Awesome job. And I also appreciate today's Saturday morning. Um, you guys will be like, oh, yaar, paach din to pad liya, bhi Saturday bhi padna hai, Saturday bhi ghanta hai. Uh, But thank you guys for doing so. Uh, so now let's get back. I will keep deviating from the presentation. Uh, apologies for that as well. I love talking. Uh, but if I'm talking way too much, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and tell me, hey, Shreya, stick to the topic, right? Do not deviate. Uh, OK. Let's see. OK, guys, uh, are you able to see my screen? OK, perfect. OK, so we're going to talk about medical manufacturing um, and regulations. I have tried to keep this super general. Um, there are a few topics that you might already know about. Uh, that you might have already studied about, but we'll touch base a little bit of everything. Uh, okay, perfect. Let's talk about evolving fields, fields in medical device, right? Um, I know you guys are engineering students. Uh, I did get a chance, uh, not that I got a chance, but I did try to look at the syllabus that you guys are 
uh, currently studying. I'm not sure which semester you guys are in, uh, but you guys belong to biomedical engineering, if I'm not wrong, and you guys study a ton of subjects that are a little bit of everything from all the other engineering disciples. Uh, that's amazing. Um, we're going to try to relate those engineering fields and how they help in medical devi medical devices, right? Anybody who's doing a mechanical engineering, we have a notion that, oh, mechanical engineering student will eventually work on either designing machines or work with machines um, or something like that. But uh, very rarely do we think, oh, we need mechanical engineers, mechanical engineers in the field of medical device as well. Who is going to make the drawings of catheters, right? We need mechanical engineers to make drawings. We need mechanical engineers to design equipments. We need mechanical engineers to design tools that are going to help make these medical devices, correct? So um, cyber security. Um, why? Okay, let's keep this a little interactive. Feel free. There's no right or wrong answer to any of the questions. Um, feel free if you don't want to answer. That's also okay, but I would really appreciate if someone tells me what OK, that was interesting. I think I got dropped off the meeting. OK, perfect. So let's go back to the question. Why do you guys think cybersecurity is one of the evolving fields? Can anyone tell me in vague idea? What is cybersecurity? Anyone? Going once, going twice, going thrice. OK. Um, Cybersecurity, right? Let me share back my screen. Um, OK, here we go. OK, so we all hear this word cybersecurity, right? Uh, Ma'am, you were going to say something? OK. Um, Hey. OK. Um, sorry for that. OK, let's go back. OK, so cybersecurity, right? We all are online all of the time. We are on our social media. We are on our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, uh, taking our online classes. Everything is happening online, correct? How much secure do you feel sharing your personal information? Online, um, we see that little comment um, every time you start a new chat on your WhatsApp. This chat is encrypted. Nobody can take a look at your chat other than you and the other person who's talking to you or you're talking to that person, correct? Uh, that's cybersecurity. We need to make sure uh, our medical records uh, of every patient is secure enough. Uh, now that everything is going online, we have telemedicine. You are talking to your doctors online uh, through video calls, consulting, taking advices. You're getting medicines prescribed. Uh, let's say you go for an imaging, you go for an X-ray, you go for um, MRI scan, um, or you take a blood work, for example. 
all of the reports are saved somewhere. Uh, you go to your uh, family doctor, um, get some reports, your family doctor uh, refers you to a specialist. Uh, family doctor says, don't worry, I'll send over the records. How? Uh, and uh, how is your family doctor going to share these records with the specialist that you're going to visit in a couple of days? Uh, via internet, he's going to share, he or she is going to share uh, your records uh, online via an email or a quick text, uh, or, if, or if there is any quality management system between the doctors or between uh, same set of hospitals that they share, they can send it over um, to that same QMS system. We need to make sure that the medium that you're using to share your medical personal records are secure. Um, we normally get into a lot of issues where your profile gets hacked. Somebody uses your picture, creates a new profile uh, under your name. We don't want that to happen. That's why cybersecurity comes into picture, correct? Uh, let's talk about wearable fitness. I'm wearing an Apple Watch. Why? Not because it's fancy. Uh, yes, little part of it, it's a little fancy. But uh, our new iWatches, our new fitness trackers, your Fitbits, uh, measure your uh, oxygen content of your body. They measure your heartbeat. They measure your blood pressure. Um, for someone like me who goes to work every single day, uh, with uh, I have been to work uh, from the day one uh, that COVID has happened, right? I have never had the opportunity of work from home. I'm always putting myself out there. Uh, and my chances of getting infected are super duper high. Uh, this little thing on my arm keeps a track of my oxygen, keeps a track of my heart. Um, little bit on uh, affordable side, uh, wearable fitness. Oh, if you go, five or 10 years back, how would you check your blood pressure? How would you check your heart rate? You would have to travel to your family doctor or a medical organization and get your vitals. We call them vitals, right? Your blood oxygen, heart rate, blood pressure, they're vitals. You would have to go somewhere to get your vitals checked. But I have my vitals right here on my wrist. Uh, you would say this is like a 10% medical device by itself. Uh, medical robots. Um, the technology is evolving where we have robots uh, doing surgical procedures on humans. We have a company called Intuitive uh, in the Bay Area in California, if you might have not heard. They are pioneering a Da Vinci robot, which uh, combined with artificial intelligence can uh, perform complicated uh, surgical procedures under uh, a doctor or a medical professional supervision, correct? Um, 3D printed objects. This is a super interesting field um, that has gotten me interested in uh, recent weeks. We do have uh, a couple of medical, uh, not medical, but a couple of 3D printers at work. Uh, we do design a little fixtures uh, in a couple of hours, uh, have them tested on our manufacturing floors, production floors, and if it works, we'll send the prototype to a manufacturing facility outside, which can make uh, the same part for us in metals, right? We don't do metal manufacturing. Um, also, your prosthesis, prosthesis, if I'm saying that right, uh, if someone loses a limb or someone loses a hand, uh, your artificial limbs cost a ton uh, for you, uh, some people go bankrupt because they're super expensive. The technology is not that, uh, it is advanced now, but if you see a couple of years ago, it was not that advanced and all of these processes were expensive uh, and they were not comfortable at all. Um, but now with 3D printing, 3D printing, you can print an artificial, um, like for yourself in a couple of days, right? Um, Genomic medicine, we have seen in the medical field, we have uh, especially challenged people, right? People who suffer from Down syndrome, people who suffer from progeria, uh, people who suffer from n number of diseases. Um, how does genomic medicine work uh, in such cases, correct? Uh, 
even before uh, the baby is born, we get to know what their DNA is, uh, what the mother's DNA is, what their father's DNA is going to be. Uh, we can artificially change uh, the existing DNA pattern and make sure, uh, let's say, uh, Down syndrome ha always has uh, a one extra chromosome or one less chromosome that makes them special. Um, we can make sure that that special chromosome is either, if it's present, we can take it out, or if it's not there, we can put it back. Uh, so that's where genomic medicine uh, comes into picture in um, helping create medicines uh, for people where normal existing medications don't work. Uh, what is computer vision? Your uh, imaging uh, equipment, your MRI scans, your X-ray scans, your ultrasound, your sonographies, uh, they're all computer vision, correct? They use ultrasound, uh, uh, infrared rays uh, to make sure everything inside your body works fine. Uh, there is a recent innovation, not innovation, but a recent development in this sector is um, when there is a trauma, when someone uh, has a very severe accident and comes to the emergency room or comes to a hospital to get treated from the accident site. Uh, our current x-ray, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Many of you might have gotten an X-ray somewhere uh, at some point in your life when you were kids, you broke a bone, or you thought you broke a bone and needed an X-ray, or you had a soft, soft tissue injury and you wanted, and your doctor said, hey, you know what, just go get an X-ray done for, uh, you know, just to be sure. Uh, if you see those X-ray machines, they're huge, they're bulky, uh, and they can take only one image at a time at one of one part of your body, correct? But now we have uh, equipment that can scan your entire body in less than 10 seconds. Just imagine the time that is getting saved. Um, that is the time that we gain back in treating the patient, correct? Instead of taking picture of every single bone of your body will take hours and that just delays the treatment uh, given to the patient, correct? 5G technology. Uh, I'm pretty sure people already have 4G on their phones, LTE on their phones. This is exactly what we're talking about, 5G technology in your phones. The speed of the internet, the speed of information exchange um, is what we're talking about. We need high speed internets to exchange information of uh, a patient. Uh, again, why do we need such high uh, speed or high internet speed to um, exchange information so that the treatment is faster. We can save multiple lives at the same time, um, right? Virtual reality, very interesting. And uh, uh, the use of virtual reality is also uh, mind blowing in the field of uh, medicine, right? Um, I know recently Samsung came up with uh, a VR where you just put your phone inside that uh, VR system, put it on your eyes, and then you can start playing a game. But uh, we are using virtual reality in rehabilitation of the patients. Um, the company that I work with right now, Penumbra, has something called as real systems. It's nothing but a virtual system. Uh, you put the same equipment on your eyes. You have those little controllers in your hands, just like your video games. Uh, if someone is suffering from a stroke uh, or a paralysis and is, and is trying to gain movement in any part of your body, these VR systems are fun. Games are fun, right? Uh, just by playing games, uh, doctors and medical professionals are able to regain the movement uh, that was lost in their arms or in their body. So. Uh, so whatever I explain, evolving fields in medical device, right? If you think you're a biomedical engineer and you're only supposed to, and you can, if you think you on, you can only work in uh, a medical device uh, company or you can only work in a pharmaceutical type of space, uh, I just opened a bunch of uh, opportunities for you. And then we are always looking for engineers who are ready to help in the medical field, right? Uh, how can engineering help? That's what we talked about. 
uh, right now, uh, health medicine or health medical device industries, uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, you guys already know, you guys are experts in what you're currently studying at. Uh, the applications include biocompatible processes. We talked about it. Uh, we talked about making personalized uh, and affordable processes for people who cannot afford uh, the expensive ones, various diagnostic and therapeutic medical devices. Um, what are diagnostic instruments? When you go uh, get a blood work done um, and doctor says, hey, we got to count your uh, white blood cells. We got to count your red blood cells. We got to count how much is your protein level? How much is your uh, creatinine? Creatinine is something that is uh, measured when you have kidney issues or something like that, right? They ask you to do a renal profile. Uh, what happens to the blood that is taken out by your a uh, pathologist or by your family doctor, where does that go? How do you come to know uh, the amount of protein that's there in your body? Uh, there's something called as diagnostic machines where they use uh, light technology. Uh, they use, uh, okay, I can't remember the name on top of my head right now, but there are several technologies uh, that they use to measure. Uh, we'll talk about some. Uh, uh, in the process, um, but uh, those are what the diagnostic machines do. Measure your protein levels, your vitamin levels, uh, therapeutic medical devices, what therapeutic medical de devices, uh, something that can help you uh, rehabilitate yourself. We just talked about uh, uh, virtual reality, uh, real systems, they help in therapeutic medical devices, right? Uh, clinical equipment to micro implants. Uh, very interesting one. Uh, I know I have said very interesting to a lot of topics and I'm going to keep saying that um, because I'm super passionate about uh, um, the opportunity that I've got to use my engineering and doing something good to the society and giving back to the medicine field. Uh, yep, clinical equipment to micro implants, right? We just saw a video of how catheters were used um, to take out a clot, right? Uh, but sometimes uh, the clot that, that has happened in an artery or a vein, it's easy to take out, but also very easily that the vein and the artery is susceptible to creating a clot again. Uh, that's where the stents come in place. Uh, many people who have issues with their hearts, have a heart attack or a stroke, have a stent put in by an open heart surgery or um, that, uh, hold on, angioplasty, correct. Uh, the process is angioplasty where you put in your um, stent in. You need some kind of equipment to put that little pipe or a hollow or a cylindrical device called stent inside your um, body, correct? Those are micro implants. Also, uh, let's talk about pacemakers. What are pacemakers? They uh, help your heart beat, uh, help your heart beat and pump blood throughout your body when your heart is weak enough um, and cannot do by its own. Uh, we need someone to design that. We need someone who understands uh, how a heart works. Uh, I know you guys study human anatomy. Um, you guys know how heart speed or how um, organs work in your body. We need people like you. We need manufacturing engineers, right, to design. Uh, if the equipment is going to work on electricity, we need electrical engineers. Uh, if it's supposed to have some ICs, some chips, we need electronic uh, engineers, right? Uh, same with the measuring equipment. We talked a ton about uh, MRI, ECG, X-ray scans. Uh, pharmaceutical drug manufacturing. You guys are studying biomedical engineering. You know what chemical compounds are made of. You know how to break those chemical compounds. You know how to put chemicals back together or mix chemicals to make new chemicals. Um, correct? Uh, and you know what chemical can work with what... Uh, diseases, uh, you know, what chemicals are useful for, what chemicals can uh, attack certain species of diseases. Uh, uh, that's why we need biomedical engineering or engineering help uh, in medicine, right? Uh, 
healthcare engineering. So this was something that I came across during my research on putting this presentation together for you guys. I was not aware of this kind of engineering field that also um, exists. Uh, just reading through what healthcare engineering is, uh, engineering a major factor of advancement through creating, development, and implementing cutting edge devices, systems, and procedures attributed to breakthrough in electronics, information technology, miniaturization, material science, and some field. Um, correct? What is miniaturization? Uh, we talked about pace uh, makers, uh, they help your heart beat. Uh, uh, they help your heart pump blood uh, throughout the rest of your uh, body when your heart is weak and cannot do by its own. Uh, you can design a device that's uh, a food by food, uh, right? One feet by one feet. Or you can de design a device that's a centimeter by centimeter. What would you like to be put inside your body? Uh, an equipment that's one feet by one feet, that's so huge that you would actually be carrying the device on your body in a bag or maybe in a bubble that's around you so that you don't get infected? Or would you prefer a centimeter by centimeter implant that's good enough uh, and works just like the big device, right? So uh, why miniaturization is important? Because we see a lot of diseases, a lot of little babies, a lot of newborn babies also suffer from diseases that an adult uh, suffered through, but we cannot put in bigger devices that we would normally use for an adult in a small baby, right? The size of a small baby is smaller. We need miniaturization. Who can do it? Engineers like you and me can help people who already work in R&D, bring up new ideas, bring up uh, something that you have read about, something that you have studied, um, but uh, one plus one equal to two together and um, help achieve this miniaturization, right? Material science, why do we need it? Again, uh, we have few devices uh, that go inside your body. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, material is compatible uh, with your body. Uh, it's compatible with the water content of your body, blood content of your body, compatible with your muscles, compatible with your blood type. Uh, what, how would you feel if uh, a material uh, is used uh, to cure one disease in your body but ends up leaving another disease in your body, right? Uh, does it make sense? You wouldn't like that. That's why material science is important. We need to do enough research to make sure whatever materials that we use or that goes inside your body or does not go inside your body is thoroughly researched and used and verified and validated uh, before it's put out in the market for public use, right? Um, but if you're really interested into medical manufacturing, please take a look at healthcare engineering. Uh, it's an upcoming field. You can do masters and bachelors as well. If you're um, interested in doing double um, bachelors, uh, that is something that uh, students in US do take up, um, but very interesting field in general. Uh, right. Uh, I'm going to talk about six groundbreaking medical invention. Very briefly, you guys know what this is about. Uh, uh, feel free to ask for this presentation. Uh, I did share uh, it with Kendra. I can share it with Ma'am also. Uh, you can go over the presentation in deep, and if you have any questions, always feel free to reach uh, out on LinkedIn to me or. Uh, um, I have been told by Geeta ma'am and my husband that you guys love to text and would like to leave questions or any queries by uh, in the chat box. Um, I would love to answer those at the end of the session. Uh, but let's get back to groundbreaking medical innovation, right? Surgical robots, uh, super precise, super accurate. We have a few applications listed on our screens. Uh, but we are looking at technological advancements where uh, these applications will keep increasing uh, and the areas where we will have surgical robots will uh, increase, right? So you will have a surgical robot basically in every medical organization in coming years. Uh, what are drawbacks? 
Uh, it's a machine at the end of the day. It is supposed to work for only so many hours. It requires preventive maintenance, maybe once a quarter, once in six months, depending on the machine, or maybe an yearly. Uh, it needs calibration. Uh, and uh, obviously it costs high. It costs about a million of more than a million dollars for each surgical robot. So we need some good investors or some good funding to have one of these on uh, the hospital floor, right? Uh, nuclear imaging therapy. We talked about imaging therapy. We talked about MRI scans. Uh, we talked about X-rays, but something called there's also something called as radio immunotherapy, uh, drug discovery and development, uh, radioactive iodine therapy is used in cancer patients. Uh, but all of those. Uh, uh, We'll talk about the six medical in innovations. Uh, these are non-invasive and usually painless. Uh, radioactive iodine therapy sometimes injected uh, in your blood. It's non-invasive. Nobody's cutting open your body. Uh, no stitches, no anesthesia. Uh, less recovery time. Uh, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, telemedicine. We have been doing this from a very long time. I know years ago, my mom's uh, a doctor. She's an infertility specialist. Um, growing up, I have seen she consulting on phones. They would she would always receive calls. Uh, hey, doctor, madam, can you uh, help me with something? I have a running nose. I have temperature. Can you suggest me over the counter medicines? So we've been doing this for a very long time, but in the recent year and a half COVID situation, we have seen this uh, technology getting better and better and better every single day, right? Um, if we fall sick in uh, America here, we don't go to a doctor. We would just schedule a video appointment with uh, one of our um, healthcare provider. They would tell us what to do. They'll suggest over the top, over the counter medicines, and then we are good to go with. Well, only go to the hospital if there's something serious and cannot be taken care of at home or by the or counter medicines, right? So telemedicine is going to be the future uh, now. Uh, and it's easy, right? It's just a phone call away. It's just a video call away. You're not taking a bus, not taking a rickshaw or not taking a train to go see your family doctor or uh, anything like that. Uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. We talked about it. It's a superb uh, way of rehabilitation uh, for someone who has gone through severe trauma um, or if someone just has anxiety, right? Separation anxiety or all sorts of anxiety. Um, augmented reality and virtual reality can make sure that the person is uh, feeling safe, uh, feeling uh, content, feeling needed uh, or wanted or whatever you guys want to put that in. Uh, but it just increases the recovery time. Again, uh, everything that we're going to talk about is making sure that the patient is uh, in good hands and is taken care of. Um, 3D printing and artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't have to say anything more than what it says. Uh, artificial intelligence is something that can take care of you right then and there in the absence of a medical professional. Uh, these uh, applications uh, are pretty straightforward. Uh, online scheduling of the appointments, just take check your doctor's name, uh, click on the name, click on their calendar, see the time that they're available, see the time that suits you, press confirm, your appointment is confirmed, you're going to talk to the doctor at that uh, particular time, correct? Uh, 3D printing, we talked about prosthesis uh, also. Uh, anatomical models for surgical preparations. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are working uh, on 3D printing organs that are 100% functional, uh, but that is not in use yet. But I know many companies in um, California are working towards it. So we don't have to wait for a donor organ. If you need one, you can 3D print it by uh, uh, by using a medical 3D printer, right? Uh, super fast. Uh, any questions? I know I'm going super fast. Um, I want to make sure that you guys understand. 
I uh, did speak a lot about medicine, but I spoke very less about uh, how engineering can help. I wanted to give you guys an overview of uh, all of the fields that are currently growing outside of your knowledge, or maybe you also know about it. Uh, but at every step or every sentence that I just spoke, we need engineering. Without engineering, there is not going to be any medicine. There's not going to be any equipment. Uh, there's not going to be any treatment for that matter, right? So before we move in, any questions? I cannot access the chat box right now. Uh, so if you can just unmute yourself or ask. If not, then we can always uh, answer the questions at the end of the session. Yes, Shreya, there are a few questions actually. OK, uh, let me stop sharing. We can come back and then see if we have any chat. OK, uh, whenever a patient undergoes angioplasty or other surgeries or blood testing, etc., why do they charge so much? Is it because of the devices that they use? Um, like I wanted to know what are the parts required to make a particular device which makes it so 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 expensive if that makes it so expensive then it's better we replace it with something that that's a very good question uh, okay so um did medical electronics engineer have scope as biomedicals uh we'll answer that question as well so let's try to answer the first question correct um, first of all, why are medical procedures so expensive? Uh, and why are anything that is related to medicine is expensive? Uh, let me get, tell you guys a joke. I think you might have already hear, heard about it. Uh, a car mechanic and a surgeon, a heart surgeon, are um, having a chat together, right? A heart surgeon is uh, getting his car fixed at a car mechanic at his body shop. Uh, and... Uh, he is just talking. They both are having chat. The car mechanic is working on the doctor's uh, car, correct? Uh, and he's asking the same question. Why do you guys charge, right? Uh, why are medical procedures so expensive? And what does the doctor say? Uh, you work on a car. Um, do you keep the car machine running or do you shut it down when you repair it? And the answer for the car mechanic is, well, was yes, we do switch off the car, correct? We cannot keep the car working and try to fix what the problem is. If we try to do that, there'll be a boom. The car might go on in flames. You cannot work on a car that is working. Uh, but as a cardiac surgeon, we have to work on you while the heart is working, correct? We cannot stop the heart. Uh, or stop pumping blood in your body while we work on it. Uh, you can replace a car very easily. One goes uh, out or you are just bored of a car. Five years you owned it, you don't like it, you replace the car. Can you replace a person? Can you replace uh, anyone for that matter? Any human being for that matter? No, right? Um, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, you are uh, working on a live patient, uh, live person, and life cannot be measured in money, right? Uh, again, why uh, are devices so expensive? Whenever you manufacture, we'll talk about this in regulations as well, uh, but I'll give you a brief idea about it. Uh, let's say, for example, I manufacture catheters. Uh, from the inhibition of an idea that I need to make a catheter. It does take tons of, not tons, it takes years of education, years of medical practice. Um, and let's say I sit down, okay, I'm gonna make a catheter. I'm gonna sit and work on a drawing that is feasible, uh, that is efficient. Uh, I'm going to call in 10 more people. I'm going to call in mechanical engineering. Hey, this is a rough idea. I just drew it on a pen and paper. Can you put this in a nice drawing? He says, yes. Uh, I'm going to talk to a material science, material science or material uh, science specialist for that matter. Hey, uh, come up with the material that is biocompatible, that is water soluble, that can easily go in a human body. Uh, 
combine his experience, combine the mechanical uh, engineer's experience, right? Um, you just don't need a catheter. You need a machine or to pump something out, right? You need that suction to uh, pump something out of the body. Um, you might need another mechanical engineer to design that uh, system. You need electronic engineer. So if you try to combine so many experiences, and so much effort that goes into that particular product. And let's say you have a working prototype. Now you have to do validation. Uh, if you go five to 10 years, uh, let's say 20 years uh, back in the past, there were no dummies. There were no human simulations that were available that you could test your product in. So there were, they were tested on live humans. Hey, I'm going to cut you open. I'm going to put you under anesthesia, but I'm going to cut you open and I'm going to try this product. The sheer faith of that patient in that, person who is performing uh, is invaluable. You cannot put a cost, cost to that. Uh, you're going to do uh, tons of validation and verification processes in making that little long, tiny catheter or long, okay, long and tiny doesn't go together, but a long, uh, sleek catheter, correct? Um, that's why you need a huge medical facility that has been approved by a lot of regulatory bodies. You uh, make sure everyone gets paid to do that work. And at the end, when you just see a little catheter, you say, oh my God, this is going to cost me $200 or it's going to cost me like uh, tens and thousands of rupees. Um, what is this? It is just a tiny, uh, if you, have you guys ever looked at a stent uh, that goes in a metal, uh, that goes in your uh, arteries? It's nothing but a stainless steel um, that's, I think, probably a centimeter long or sometimes an inch long. Uh, but the amount of thought and uh, studies and energy that goes behind it, trying to save a patient's life, um, you cannot put a price on it. That's why uh, the things are expensive. We'll talk about why diagnostic uh, equipments are also expensive. Uh, one of the questions was, did my did medical, I hope I answered that question, right? If I have not, please get back to me with more specific questions and we'll try to address it. Um, does my medical electronics engineer have scope as biomedicals? Um, I am not sure how to answer that question. Let me think over it and we'll come back uh, to that question. While we talk, hopefully I can think through it and try to answer uh, the questions uh, much better. But in the meanwhile, keep texting, keep uh, sending in chats, or if you want to stop me in between and ask me questions, feel free uh, to do that. Okay, hold on, there you go. One more question. By instrumentation, and I want to do research in this field, but I'm not getting proper direction. As of now, I'm thinking to do MTech in biomedical. So could you please suggest me something regarding it? Absolutely. How about, uh, since this is a specific question about um, career-based and your interest-based, um, can you connect me on LinkedIn? And we can talk uh, on LinkedIn, or we can share contact information, and we can talk more about it. I can share more information, right? Um, Let's go back to the presentation. OK, so now let's talk about medical devices. Let's go back to the slide show. OK. OK, perfect. So um, in the past, I have worked for a company called Forte Bio, which was initially owned by. OK, I'm going to take a lot of company names. Don't worry about it. If you want to know more about the company, uh, shoot me a text and I'll be happy to answer any more questions or explain you what they do uh, and what kind of um, expertise do you need from education side, right? Uh, diagnostic medical devices help you diagnose what is wrong with you or with your body. Um, I work for a company called Forte Bio. Uh, it was owned by Danaher and Molecular Devices. Uh, which they sold off to a company called Sartorius, and then we had to do off the company and the logo. So what you guys see are uh, two diagnostic uh, medical devices. Uh, they are primarily used to detect any kind of protein uh, in your body, uh, especially at the molecular level, right? Uh, and I'll tell you how we measure it. Uh, so the one that you see on the bottom is an R2 system. Uh, 
uh, when I say R2 uh, is just two channel system uh, and it's one of the cheapest uh, configuration that uh, my previous company sells. Again, all of this information is available online. Nothing that I share is uh, proprietary and I will not share anything that is proprietary, right? Uh, otherwise I can get into trouble. I can literally be jailed for sharing proprietary information. Uh, but yes, um, so the one that you see on the bottom is their uh, cheapest diagnostic instrument that they sell. It costs about $20,000 uh, to $30,000 depending on uh, accessories, right? If you buy a phone, uh, it will cost you X amount of rupees, but if you wanna buy earphones, uh, AirPods with it, it's going to cost you X plus two uh, or X plus Y rupees. Or oh, if you want to buy a, a fancy case, it's going to cost you X plus Y plus Z rupees, right? Something uh, similar to these diagnostic instruments. So they cost anywhere between $20,000 to $30,000. Um, and the one on the top uh, costs about $800,000. That's about eight lakh dollars. Um, you guys very well know one dollar is about I think 75 rupees right now. I'm not sure about the exact uh, conversion rate, but uh, we'll talk about why these instruments are expensive and why uh, our diagnostic uh, pathologies or blood tests or x-rays become so expensive right in the end of the day. Uh, if you see on the, can, can you guys see my um, mouse? Uh, if anyone can just say a quick yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So if you see this tiny box, um, this vertical box is something called as optic box. Uh, it can be stationary or moving. I'll explain uh, what stationary and moving is, uh, correct? So the arm on the left, this dark black arm on the left, where this little optic box is attached is called as X, Y, Z stage. Uh, there's something in the back that you cannot see in the dark is called as power box. Uh, the one that you see in the front with this little blue tray and a black tray are called sample sensor stage. They can be stationary or moving. We'll talk more about it. Um, uh, and then the little two things that you can see that attached to the optic box are called as sensors. They are uh, body sensors. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more about uh, each component. Your XYZ stage, um, as the name suggests, XYZ, it's a stage uh, that allows you to move in all three directions, X, Y, and Z direction. It gives the optic box that is attached to it, it gives its movement so that it could come down, go up, move back, move front, go right, go left. That's the XYZ stage. Again, why we need an XYZ stage, we'll talk about that also. What is a power box? Uh, basically a box that has a lot of electronic components that make sure whatever um, voltage output that your um, instrument is booked into um, it regulates it and only gives a certain amount of electricity what the machine requires right uh, why because this machine is sold in multiple countries and the power sources for multiple countries are different uh, that's why we need a power box uh, let's talk about optic box uh, optic box is called optic box because because it has a lot of uh, fiber optics. I'm pretty sure you guys know what fiber optics is. Um, it has something called as spectrometers in it as well. And it is also, it also has something called as light source in it. When we talk about fiber optics, we talked about, we talk about, um, light source and we talk about spectrometers. So there is a light source. Uh, there is a fiber optic that gets, that absorbs all of the light from the light source. Uh, passes the light through the spectrometer. The spectrometer processes light uh, at a certain wavelength, at a certain spectrum, passes it back to the um, fiber optics, and then fiber optics are connected to these two sensors. If you see that are on the bottom of the optic box, and they are dipped into these trays. Um, 
Now fiber optics you might know are super expensive. Uh, they are customized manufacturing. Um, you do not get those off the shelf. So since they're made to design and made to order, um, the cost goes high. The equipment is customized as well. That's why uh, the cost goes high up again. Um, there is high demand for fiber optics, but uh, low supply. That also increases the price. Uh, the spectrometers are also customized as per uh, the company's need. The equipment is different. Um, uh, the supply is less also, and there are a lot of sensitive and moving parts in the spectrometer uh, that makes it difficult to um, assemble. Depending on the country, depending on the labor wage of that country, um, that part become expensive. Power source can be your little, uh, your uh, bedroom yellow light uh, or any yellow light for that matter. But since these are compact instruments, you cannot use huge um, uh, bulbs. They also have to be customized manufacturer, which again drives up the cost um, and assembly, right? Labor rates in America are, uh, or for any other country, uh, are high uh, that drives up the price of the uh, system. Let's talk about sample sensor stage and what the sample sensor stage consists of. It consists of a tilted well plate. The black uh, tray that you see has 96 wells in it in that little tray and they are tilted. Uh, There's a reason why they are tilted. Uh, we'll get to it as well. Uh, the blue tray that you see has bio sensors in it. So the needles uh, or uh, that you see that are hanging off the optic box are called bio sensors. Um, these are disposable. These are only one use and these are dipped in a certain chemistry. So there we go. We need chemical engineers also. Uh, the chemistry that goes into these bio sensor tray uh, keeps them moist. They do not evaporate as uh, fast as water does. Uh, Water also evaporates at a normal temperature, but at a slower speed. This does not uh, vaporize as fast as the water does comparatively. So a certain type of chemistry, uh, not only does it help uh, the biosensors to keep them moist, it uh, also, the chemistry also depends on what kind of protein you want to check in your blood sample, right? Um, so this tilted, plate that you see is a tray where you're going to put your blood samples in. Um, um, let's say you want to check your uh, vitamin B level in your uh, blood. So you're going to draw the blood from the patient, uh, use uh, a special type of equipment to pick the blood up and put this in this tiny uh, trays that you see on the right. Um, the optic box comes down, picks up the biosensors, uh, puts, uh, inserts them. So it, it moves towards right. So that's why XYZ stage uh, is present. Um, the optic stage moves towards the right, comes down, dips the biosensors into the well tilted well plates. Uh, why is this going on? We have a light source that's coming down uh, through the biosensors from the optic box, correct? Um, I wish I had a whiteboard. Uh, it would have been so much easier for me to explain you guys, but I'll try my best. We'll, we'll uh, work with what we have right now. Um, uh, once these biosensors are dipped in those tilted well plates on the right hand side, um, the sensor stage has tiny motors inside that move uh, the tilted well plates in a counter. Um, Counterclockwise and uh, anti the opposite direction. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't um, anti -clock anti clockwise or counterclockwise something. Uh, basically, it it revolves uh, it rotates uh, in both direction, uh, making sure that the blood sample that is there in the tray is constantly moving. Now, how does a light source uh, help in? counting the amount of vitamin D, it, it sounds nonsense, right? Um, how does the light help you count uh, vitamin D levels in your blood? Every little protein uh, 
has its own viscosity and has and has its own reflection um, count, I would say, um, or with what intensity the light reflects from the solution and at what angle does the light reflects from the solution. So when the biosensors dip down in the uh, tilted well plate, um, it is not only uh, emitting light from the optic box, but it's also absorbing light back. Uh, uh, the optic box is also absorbing light back. Um, so in the whole process of emitting and absorbing, uh, there's a specialized software that the company releases where you can count the amount of protein that you have. Um, so if you want to uh, count a different type of vitamin, let's say A, uh, the protein A will reflect light in a different manner. Uh, protein vitamin B12 will uh, reflect light in a different manner. Let's say you want to count in how much calcium you have. Uh, the calcium compound will reflect light in a different manner. All this is pre-researched. We know how these uh, compounds reflect lights. Uh, when all of this is processed and simulated together, you get a count. Um, Correct. Uh, why this is uh, less expensive from the one that we see on the bottom? Obviously, the size is different. Uh, the bigger one uh, is bigger in size. Uh, uh, is, uh, is that the reason why the price is uh, super high? I mean, it goes from twenty, thirty thousand dollars to uh, something that is eight to nine lakh uh, uh, dollars. Uh, you see only two uh, biosensors that is hanging um, on the optic box. Uh, this instrument is capable of only picking two biosensors at a time and you have 96 well plates. So can you calculate, uh, let's say one cycle is about a minute. Um, you need 48 minutes or something like that. Uh, you guys are better at calculation than I am. Uh, it just takes a lot of time for the two centers, two sensors to complete the 96 samples that are in the plate, correct? So the one machine that you see on the top has 96 sensors coming in at the same time. Uh, the process time is smaller with the bigger machine. Uh, it's called a Red 96 uh, machine, Octet Red 96 uh, machine. So 96 samples can test, uh, 96 biosensors can test 96 samples at the same time. Uh, your process time goes down, but if you compare the cost of 96 spectrometers, 96 uh, fiber optics, uh, about it has about eight uh, light sources um, that are coming in uh, from each direction, each corner of the instrument, um, it's expensive. And it not only has one tilted plate, but uh, this particular instrument has two tilted plates. So you can have 96 plus 96 samples. Um, again, even if you add in one more plate, your process time is going to be much slower. That's why uh, the cost of the instrument is uh, high. Um, and also the rate of uh, return of investment of this instrument needs to be justified. Uh, for any kind of organization, and um, that's why. And how how are, how is any organization going to um, get back the money that it has invested in any uh, equipment, right? By uh, pricing the tests at a certain amount. Um, that's why the processes are uh, expensive. Uh, uh, any questions about diagnostic instruments? Let me unshare so that I can see if there are any more questions. Okay. I know there is a whiteboard option, but I am too bad at using those and I don't even have a mouse. So I am like super um, deficient in the current technology. But I don't see any. Uh, there is one. Uh, Maya, I'm interested in bioinstrumentation. Yes, I did uh, address that question. Um, since it is a little uh, career related uh, to a specific person, I um, 
would highly encourage uh, get in touch with me via LinkedIn or uh, you can get in touch with Geeta ma'am and get my contacts from her and reach out to me in person. We can talk more about it. Um, does that make sense to everyone? A thumbs up on your screens. OK, perfect. Awesome. Um, any questions about the diagnostic instruments? Awesome. OK, so no questions going once, going twice, uh, going thrice. OK, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to the slideshow. Let's talk about uh, surgical medical devices, right? Um, you can divide the surgical medical devices into three categories. Class one, class two, class three. Um, one of the professors did mention we have regulations. Uh, every country, every continent or uh, a set of countries have their own uh, classification when it comes to medical devices. Europe has their own regulations. US has FDA, Food and Drug Administration organizations. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, there's something uh, um, India also follows that I'm not aware of, which is very bad. I'm going to do some research and see what regulations India has. Um, but according to FDA, uh, US has categorized medical devices into three categories. Class one is your normal uh, medical uh, equipment or devices that are available, uh, sometimes available easy for you, sometimes they're not. Uh, as easy as examination gloves, elastic bandages, and handheld surgical instruments. Um, when you say handheld surgical instruments, they can be your um, stainless steel scissors that your doctor uses, uh, scalpels uh, that the surgeons use. Uh, they can either be used once and thrown away. They can either be disposable or can be reused again with proper sterilization methods. Uh, class two is something that helps patients get better. Uh, helps them in process of rehabilitation, acupuncture needles, uh, powered wheelchairs, so surgical drapes, surgical robots um, that are uh, under the supervision of uh, a surgeon. Uh, they are not completely on their own. Uh, uh, they're basically remote control robots and the remote is with the surgeon. Uh, class three is something that goes inside your body or something that helps you survive. Implantable pacemakers, pulse generators, automated external defibrillators. Can anyone tell me what are defibrillators? Let's give 30 seconds. I'm going to have a sip of. Sip of an energy drink, so. Any idea what are defibrillators? Come on, guys, you can do better. You know how to talk. Um, you know how to unmute your uh, mute button and uh, answer. No yeah, idea what these are. Uh, gets us uh, revived from the shock. If we, if the heart uh, gets a shock, it cannot uh, function itself uh, due to the shock. So we have to revive it to function back to normal. So. Defibrillators are used to get it back to normal. Awesome. See, that's an awesome answer. I, I this this uh, restores faith in me that you know you guys can you guys know more stuff than I do and you guys can speak right. Um, I know it's difficult to sit quiet for two hours um, and listen to somebody talk that you have not seen before or you have not even met before. Um, but awesome answer. Uh, yes, when a heart stops uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, you need to shock uh, your heart. You need to send a certain pulse of uh, power, a certain pulse of voltage uh, to your heart so that it starts uh, at least for a few minutes or momentarily until some medical help arrives, correct? Um, these are uh, class three surgical devices. OK, uh, another very interesting uh, for recent innovations in surgical procedures. 
um, Marvel, um, multi angle rear view endoscopic tool. Um, just the name itself is uh, super fancy. Uh, it took me two minutes to understand what uh, is a multi angle rear view endoscopic tool. Um, everyone knows how to drive a car or know someone who drives a car. Uh, we all know what a rear view rear view mirror is and we have to constantly look in a rear view mirror uh, making sure some nobody rear ends your car uh, makes sense right uh, same thing um, this is a catheter like a structure uh, a tube like a structure that has a camera attached to the um, other end that's going inside your body uh, and there is a screen on the other end, uh, the one that uh, you are holding, uh, and it is taking continuous pictures or it's recording a video as it's going inside your body, correct? Uh, but it is not only used for uh, viewing the images that uh, are the, um, images of uh, your body while it's going in but it's a tiny camera that allows surgeons to get a very precise 3D view of a tumor when, when performing a resection, right? Uh, when the surgeons are uh, performing a resection, uh, it's uh, mostly minimally invasive, so you're not able to look at how big the tumor is uh, and what organs the tumor is touching. So this endoscopic tool uh, gives you a better idea on a screen uh, of exactly how big a tumor uh, actually is, right? Uh, if you don't know the size of the tumor and you're just resecting a tiny portion of it, you're not doing any good. You might have to open up uh, the patient or go back in with the same tool to uh, take it out, right? So this is a very innovative and uh, a very recent innovation. Uh, smart surgical glasses. How many of you have heard about Google Glasses? I believe many of you. Uh, Google Glasses help you um, not only see better, but it also has a tiny screen within your glasses that helps you or show, shows, it, uh, it helps you display the music that you're uh, uh, listening to in your ear pods or AirPods or your earphones, or uh, if you're driving, you need maps, your Google Glasses can help you see the maps. Um, very similar concept for surgical uh, glasses. Uh, they're essentially small computers, which include a head-mounted monitor and a video camera. Uh, imagine how easy would it be to see what is coming um, your way when you're operating on a patient, right? You can be prepared prepared beforehand uh, for any kind of catastrophe uh, if that is going to happen. Uh, if everything is good, you know, everything is good, everyone's going to live a happy life. Uh, that's smart surgical glasses. Uh, surgical robots with artific artificial intelligence. Uh, we talked about artificial intelligence and surgical robots uh, differently, but this is something that we put it together. Uh, artificial intelligence removes uh, the limitations uh, inherent in a human being being a robotic arm while conceding that robots will always need real surgeons at the helm to make sound decisions, right? So these robots are at the mercy of surgeons, uh, you can say. Um, some surgeons might be tall, might be short, uh, might be healthy, uh, might be lean. Uh, it, they come in all sizes as size, sizes and shapes, right? Uh, a surgeon. Um, the patient also comes in different sizes and shapes. Um, it is sometimes difficult to put in your hand inside a human body trying to grab a tumor out or trying to remove a blood clot out. Uh, but these robotic arms are lean and efficient, can reach uh, deep inside your body without damaging any of the other organs. Um, but they need to be told what to do. So this is something surgical robots and artificial intelligence coming together. Uh, remote robotics. Um, 
Sometimes you have a specialist that is sitting across the country, cannot travel, for example, during COVID, or due to COVID restrictions, we cannot come to India or anyone in India cannot travel to US. If there is a specialist uh, need in any of the countries and the doctors cannot uh, fly to the patient, we use something called as remote robotics, where you can command the robots with artificial intelligence and tell them how to do a surgical procedure. Isn't that super cool? Um, you can do multiple surgical process procedures sitting at one place, uh, saving all that money, all that time in travel, uh, preparing for a surgical procedure. Uh, amazing uh, innovations and amazing thought has been put together. Uh, but let's just step back. Right? We talk about these recent innovations in surgical procedures. How is it possible for a group of doctors to put this together? No, doctors just know human anatomy. They don't know how equipment work unless they are trained or unless they are told or unless these uh, equipments come with something called as IFU, instructions for use, uh, right? Uh, we they need engineers at every point of the time. Let's say they're making remote robotics. We need uh, electronic uh, engineer to make these uh, huge screens. We need information technology engineers trying uh, to figure out how we are going to um, uh, make sure that two distances uh, are connected through internet, through uh, making sure that the medium is safe enough. Uh, we need mechanical engineers to design these equipment. Uh, we need biomedical engineers uh, making sure that the materials that are used in making of such robotics are um, safe for human use. Again, uh, not one company will make uh, from scratch or any of the equipment from scratch. There are hundred companies working together, making one tiny component that is required at one time so that these robots come to life at a different facility. So, um, and we need a communications engineer. We need a software engineer to um, create softwares to code uh, these softwares uh, that these uh, um, doctors can use, that these machines can use. We need a engineer who's expert in user interface, making sure the icons that you see on the screen are user friendly and they are supposed to do what they're supposed to do. We need uh, uh, hardware engineers who work in storage devices or we need hardware engineers um, who design uh, hard disks or uh, this tiny chips that can process information or can send signals to the machine. Uh, that they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do, right? Uh, uh, when we talk about smart surgical glasses, we need someone whose expertise is in glass manufacturing. Um, okay, I am sorry about that, guys. Uh, we do have a golden retriever in house and who is in a very playful mood, so he's going to keep making this a uh, squeaky noise with his toys, but we'll try to avoid it, okay? I apologize for that. Um, but uh, I, we were talking about smart surgical glasses. We need uh, people whose expertise are glasses, glass manufacturing. We need to make sure that they're light reflective. Whenever you go to an ophthalmologist or an optician, he asks you N different options, right? Oh, you want a fiberglass, you want a uh, glass glass like a soda glass or oh do you want light reflected do you want day and light do you need scratch proof uh, glasses oh what kind of frames do you need do you need a plastic frame or fiber frame or metal frame um, and number of engineers design those and research on those uh, materials right um, so all sorts of engineers are required uh, to do so so let's keep moving Let's talk about catheter manufacturing and rehabilitation system, right? Uh, I, I chose uh, to talk about specific catheters because that's my day job uh, and I love what I do, correct? So um, you see a ton of pictures of uh, 
catheters and a real system on your right hand corner, bottom corner, right? Uh, that's a real system that helps um, in rehabilitation. It's a virtual system. Uh, we have multiple sensors that go on your body, uh, taking real time uh, uh, information and data from your body, making sure that the part of the body is is doing uh, what they're supposed to do uh, if they're playing a game, if they're supposed to raise their right hand, if they're supposed to, if they're playing a tennis, that particular movement is recorded. Um, if the patient has injured its uh, right shoulder and uh, cannot raise their arm to their shoulder level, that uh, type of movement is also recorded and the intensity of the game or uh, the rehabilitation program uh, changes. Um, all of this is so compact that it can go in your uh, carry-on luggage. Uh, it's so tiny. So any of the medical profession professional can carry this equipment to your home uh, or uh, to a rehabilitation uh, organization or a place where you are currently going through rehabilitation. Um, right, these are compact and people are working uh, in making this more compact because there are certain people during rehabilitation cannot take uh, even the slightest amount of weight on their body. So we have to make sure that they are light enough uh, that they can go through the entire process. Um, we saw a catheter uh, in work uh, during a video. Uh, why do we have so many catheters, correct? You see a 6F penumbra select catheter uh, on the screen. You see a Neuron Max 88, you see a Jet 7, you see a Lightning 7. Uh, all of these catheters uh, have uh, a different job uh, by itself. Uh, some are delivery catheters. What are delivery catheters? Um, their diameter, their outer diameter and inner diameter are a little larger. It helps deliver a smaller catheter inside uh, inside of it so that it could reach its destination. It makes way through the vein or artery uh, uh, in which the catheter is uh, uh, inserted, right? Uh, Lightning 7 is one of the catheters where uh, it's a long metal tube. When I say long metal tube, the first thing that comes in your mind is, oh my God, it's going to be straight, it's going to be rigid, um, it's going to be solid, uh, it's going to be strong. And our veins and uh, veins and arteries in our body are not so straight. Uh, they are a mesh, right? But this Long metal tube is something that we call a hypotube uh, in medical terms and in manufacturing term. This is a metal tube which is super, super, super flexible. Uh, it is uh, the number seven because it's 0.7 uh, millimeters in diameter. Uh, you will see something uh, named as penumbra engine on the bottom. Uh, it's a suction machine. What is the point of uh, a catheter if you don't have a suction machine? How it is going to suck the, the clot, right? You can go to the place of the clot, but what are you going to do after that? You need a machine that, um, that has enough suction power to not suck in your organs, but just enough to suck uh, out the uh, clot, right? Uh, Neuron Max O88 is a delivery catheter, uh, 6F. Uh, penumbra is a select catheter. Select catheters are normally smaller in diameter and uh, uh, longer in length. Uh, they are particularly used to reach uh, a particular destination of the clot. Uh, and Neuron Max O88 helps them um, guide um, and make its way. Uh, neuro like the other delivery catheters are a little rigid. Uh, they're not as flexible as the select catheters. That's why they're used uh, in the initial part of the body. Uh, make sense? Yes? No? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Um, are we doing okay on time? I believe so. What's the time? Okay. 
Um, I think we have enough time left. Um, uh, current and future trends. Uh, electronics technology. Can you guys give me uh, a quick example? Let me stop sharing. Um, uh, any example of electronic technologies that can be used uh, for medical devices? Any example? My iWatch. Um, it's an electronic technology that helps you measure your heart rate. Um, guys, we talked about it, right? Um, um, any other example? Any other electronic technology okay. that you know of? I am not sure if anyone is trying to answer. Okay. Uh, well, I'll try to answer. We did, uh, one of the professors did talk about uh, oximeters. Uh, they're on battery, they're electronic, right? Uh, they're electronic technology. Uh, trying to make your devices compact. Uh, what are the current trends uh, other than electronic technology? Uh, detection, diagnosis, and monitoring technologies. Um, let me put back uh, the, oh, perfect. Pacemaker, defibrillator, cardiac devices. Awesome. Uh, these all go inside the body. Um, we also want to know something that is outside the body. Um, that is compact. Uh, we need engineers to make these devices as compact as possible. Uh, let's take an example of defibrillator, right? Uh, five years ago, defibrillators were huge. They would come in a vanity pack. If you guys see makeup artists, they carry a huge uh, square box with all their makeup stuff in it. Uh, tons of foundation, tons of concealers, all shades, all eyeshadows. So basically it was a huge box and defibrillators would come in such um, huge uh, boxes. But now if you see defibrillators are nothing but two pads and a tiny screen that tells you how to do it. Um, how did we make this possible? Engineers like you and me made this possible. We went from a huge bulky box to a tiny um, uh, stickable pads that go on your skin and a tiny little screen that exactly tells you how to do so you don't even have to get trained on um, how to shock a human body. The screen will exactly tell you at what um, uh, time are you supposed to start the unit so that um, the person gets shocked at what voltage. Uh, it also tells you where to put those sticky pads in if you uh, exactly don't know uh, where to stick them. Glucometer, insulin pumps, excellent uh, answers. Yes, they are electronic devices. Uh, glucometers were initially only available with doctors and medical professionals, but uh, in the past few years, glucometer has been uh, available for common public. Uh, you might know, uh, I would pray you don't know anyone in your family who uses a glucometer. That means every one of you all are healthy. Um, but with the current trend, we do know someone who has a glucometer in handy to check their sugar, right? If somebody is uh, diagnosed with diabetes. Um, insulin pumps, the same thing. You uh, have an insulin pump, uh, uh, these days which are attached to your body, attached to uh, closer to your stomach uh, that pumps insulin on its own at regular intervals of time. So you don't even have to worry about it. Uh, you don't even have to worry about taking insulin. Uh, but uh, there's a company called Dexcom and one of our friends works as a project manager for Dexcom. Uh, Dexcom is a company where they make uh, little tiny one inch by one inch chips uh, that go on a band-aid. 
and you can just stick that bandaid in on your arm or on your thigh, depend depending on your uh, um, uh, comfort uh, level. Uh, these chips, tiny one inch by one inch, has um, thousands of tiny needles that you don't even feel that are um, uh, pricking your skin and that bandaid. And those tiny little uh, needles and that tiny little chip delivers insulin on time um, uh, whenever your body needs it. So you don't even have to carry a glucometer or an insulin pump for that matter. You stick on that uh, bandaid uh, once a week and you're good to go for insulin. Um, right? That's technology. Uh, you need a ton of engineers to work on that technology. Um, so we go from two devices to just one devices that is just up on your skin. Uh, there's another question. Can you please tell us the difference between biomedical and clinical engineering and uh, their role of the job? Um, so biomedical engineering entails uh, a lot of uh, fields we talked about. Uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, medical manufacturing, for example. Clinical engineering is a field where you know all of the expertise of this medical equipment. Um, let's say you work for a company called Sartorius um, that I used to work for. You would know how exactly this diagnostic uh, materials, uh, diagnostic devices uh, work. Um, so a job of a clinical engineering is go to uh, is to go to organizations or institutes that would require diagnostic uh, equipments, let's say uh, a pharmaceutical engineering or let's say a biomedical um, engineering college like you guys, a few of these students are working on a research project or their final year project and would require an equipment to do their to do their research. So these clinical engineers will meet with professors or um, meet with head of the departments of these universities or let's say um, institutes like medical hospitals uh, that are doing research or that need diagnostic instruments or pathologists who are in need of a newer instrument to do their tests. So these clinical engineering engineers will go and visit uh, these institute, meet these people, explain them about the product, tell them how this work um, and uh, explain them how does this work and maybe also carry an instrument with them to show them a quick demo. That's what the difference between biomedical and clinical engineering is. Um, um, but in India, we call clinical engineering as medical representatives. Um, they also come from pharmaceutical companies where uh, they know uh, about a new drug that the company has uh, 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 recently developed or recently made, and then they can go explain the doctors or medical professionals, hey, guys, we have a new XYZ drug that we are uh, introducing in the market. Please uh, take a look at the brochure. These are the areas that we are targeting in. These are the diseases that, they, that these drugs work on. Uh, so for and um, moving forward, right? Even if there's a scalpel, if there's a new um, design of scalpel that some company has come up with, they will travel with samples, give samples to medical professionals or doctors so that they can um, try a hands-on uh, experience with the new product, uh, right? Hope that answers the question. Um, we'll come back to the questions again. Let's move back. Uh, to the presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, so we talked about electronic uh, technology. We talked about detection, diagnosis, and monitoring technology. Detection is um, obviously we talked about diagnostic uh, medical equipment. Um, diagnosis also. Uh, monitoring technologies are uh, also something that we talked about, your uh, glucometer is a very good uh, example of a monitoring technology. Decentralized uh, care technologies. Now, this is a very fancy word. Uh, I am not sure if you guys have heard it or if you have not heard it. 
Uh, decentralized uh, care technology is currently a uh, blooming field. Uh, it's one of the fields. Okay, let's talk about centralized care technologies, right? Uh, we have certain equipment, certain drugs that uh, a few of the companies have monopoly over. Uh, not everyone has access to it. Um, let's say Fortis Hospital has uh, now these names are just for reference. There's nothing, no personal connection or no commercial collection connection to these names. Uh, just for a reference purpose or an example purpose, right? Uh, let's say Fortis, Fortis uh, Hospital has a tie up with uh, Penumbra Company and uh, Penumbra is one of the leading catheter manufacturing uh, facilities. Every time the Fortis, uh, Fortis Hospital needs catheters, they have to contact Penumbra's sales team, order uh, a few catheters and, for use, right? Then we will ship a few catheters to a certain hospital. Uh, basically, Penumbra uh, as a company will hold a monopoly. Um, it's a centralized location uh, where you can access uh, medical resources. We don't want that to happen. We want medical equipment or uh, medical resources available at the hospital itself. Um, in order for us to do that, we have to ramp up production. We have to ramp up a lot of things, make sure the supply chain is working nice. Uh, but basically, not let any company hold monopolies uh, on drugs or any equipments that are life saving. That's what centralized care technologies is about. Uh, minimal invasive technologies, right? Uh, it's a very upcoming um, field. We talked about surgical robots that work uh, with minimal invasive technologies, uh, making the recovery time of a patient uh, super fast, uh, not leaving huge scars. Uh, if you just had uh, a surgical procedure done, uh, you might have a big scar on your body. Sometimes that can be embarrassing also uh, uh, for many people, but minimal invasive technologies doesn't leave a huge scar. It's just like a scratch that you got when you fell down, fell down from a bike or a bicycle when you were a kid or you hurt yourself in a park, very small scar. Uh, and we also have uh, technologies where we don't use staples or stitches or even dissolvable uh, threads for that matter. We use something called as glue as uh, not the glue that you would use for your craft projects. It is a uh, medical glue uh, that does not even leave a scar. It just leaves a very tiny uh, single incision line that's not even seen anymore. Uh, that's what minimal invasive technologies are for. Um, again, we need many chemical engineers uh, who work on chemical compounds uh, that can make these kind of glues, right? That can be absorbed by skins and make sure that the skin sticks to each other after an incision. Um, synthetic organs, we talked about 3D printing organs that are completely uh, functional, uh, like your current body uh, organs, like human organs, right? Um, the current trend with synthetic organs is trying to make them more efficient and more affordable to people who need it. Um, and they don't have to wait uh, for a donor uh, on the donor list, right? Uh, we can go back uh, to current and future trends if you guys have any questions uh, later on. Let's talk about regulation. Uh, we talked about a number of uh, medical devices. Uh, uh, yes, we need a lot of brains, a lot of time, a lot of resources in trying to develop one. Now that we have developed one and now that we know what these medical devices are uh, going to be used for and what this is, it's going to tackle uh, how do we introduce that particular device to the market, right? Um, can we do that directly? No, it can save someone's life, but it can surely take someone's, uh, save someone's life, but it can surely take someone's life away as fast as it can save someone's life, right? We don't want that to happen. 
Uh, we want to make sure any medical device that is being used to treat you or your family uh, has gone through a series of testing, has gone through a series of uh, verification slash validation processes, uh, has gone through the QMS system, has gone through an organization that is uh, equipped with uh, a lot of tools making sure that these devices are supposed to do uh, what they do, right? Uh, there's a ton of uh, steps that you need to go through when uh, you are about to introduce a medical device. Uh, and let's say if uh, a device I am manufacturing in US, if I intend to sell it only in US, I will go through FDA regulations. I will get approvals from FDA. But if I have to uh, sell the same product in Europe, I have to make sure I comply with uh, European rules and regulations. Their rules and regulations might be different. Their requirements might be different. Their specifications might be different. Sometimes as easy as, oh, um, I'm a product owner for a particular type of catheter at my company and my catheters are blue, orange and green in color in US. But at the same catheter, when it goes to Europe, European um, regulation uh, can say, hey, we are not fond of your blue, orange or green color. We want pink color. Oh my God, that's a huge uh, hurdle for us to cross, right? But we have to comply with their rules and regulations, making sure that our catheter is pink in color. Um, again, same set of risk analysis, failure mode analysis, design process uh, analysis, manufacturing analysis has to put through, uh, we have to put through for the same uh, product, but uh, now that uh, product is pink in color, we have to repeat all of that. So these regulations are uh, very much important as they are uh, going to save someone's life at the end of the day and we cannot put a price to the uh, life, right? Okay, what are the requirements for regulatory approval? Uh, let's talk about establishment registration. Even before I start thinking about releasing a product in the market, or even before I start putting up banners all across, introducing so and so, um, just like, uh, let's say, for example, uh, Apple iPhones, right? Even before the Apple iPhones are uh, ready to release, we will see it's huge posters, huge banners all across the city, all across the town, uh, trying to capture the market, try to um, increase uh, the anticipation uh, of the product. That's going to try to increase your curiosity of how the actual phone would look like when it's in your hand, like a month later or maybe 12 months later. Uh, same with the medical devices. If you plan on um, uh, introducing a product to the market, you have to register your uh, institute or an organization uh, that you're going to manufacture or a brand name that you have thought about for your product with your uh, existing regulation committee. If you talk about US, uh, we talk about FDA. So if I, let's say if I'm going to introduce a new catheter, I want to let the FDA know hey, I'm working on so-and-so catheter, I need to put my company uh, in an official establishment, uh, register with the FDA, right? Uh, medical device listing, uh, that's the next step. So once my registration is done, I have my company ID number, um, XYZ things, formalities have been completed. Uh, you put your name uh, of the medical device and what it does in a medical device listing. So FDA keeps a list of all the devices, uh, that uh, are currently available in the market. Uh, obviously, we talked about classes, class one, class two, class three. So depending on what class your device falls in, they do maintain a listing and it has to go on that listing. Once that is done, we talk about pre-market notification and a pre-market approval. Now, uh, not only does the FDA uh, want your establishment registration, your device name, your uh, brand name, but there are a team of professionals from each and every field 
that's sitting in that regulatory board of F, uh, of FDA, right? Uh, or any of the regulation uh, committee. Uh, once I have a prototype ready, I need to make sure I uh, let the shareholders know of the company that I'm going to come up with a new product. That's pre-market notification. Not only does the shareholders know, but your competitors uh, from the same field also uh, know that you're going to come up with such a product. Now, this becomes a little tricky because the uh, uh, competition organization or competitive company that you're competing with might come up with a better product, but that's always a risk you're willing to take. Uh, that's a pre-market notification. Now, pre-market approval is something that you uh, provide your shareholders, your uh, FDA um, uh, organization that you know this is a product and we have done enough research. Uh, this is the uh, certain type of people or a market that we're going to target on. Uh, there are expertise from that particular market or that particular field sitting on the board. Uh, they need to give you a formal approval in writing that yes, uh, you did the pre-market notification, you have uh, followed all the rules to get here, we'll give you a pre-market approval. Uh, the next step is investigation device exemption for clinical studies. Now, once you have all of the three things uh, set together, you are still in the prototype phase. You have not tested the uh, prototypes in, uh, in an actual field or a dummy or a clinical study where uh, studies happen on live patients. Uh, so that's something that you have to fill out. Uh, let's say you are making a new design of uh, a scalpel that's used to cut people open, right? Um, that doesn't need um, uh, a clinical trial on a live patient, so you can uh, file for an exemption um, and if that goes into a human body you might uh, not get that exemption you have to go through clinical trials um, the next thing is quality system regulation uh, now this particular um, field contains your risk analysis your quality analysis your failure analysis your uh, process uh, analysis your um, design failure analysis all sorts of analysis that that uh, you can think of verification validation and all of this has to be documented your failures your wins all needs to be documented even if you miss on a particular failure and when an audit hop happens uh, the auditor uh, comes to know that you failed to uh, document a failure your license can be taken off and you cannot uh manufacture a product anymore uh and cannot put that in a market so uh, it has to go through a quality system regulation labeling requirement this can come across as uh, simple and uh, very stupid as it sounds why do we need a labeling requirement uh all medical device uh uh devices uh needs to have a proper labeling that uh states the name the brand what is the use for uh, who is going to use it when is it going to use and if the product comes with a manual um, it, instructions for use ifus uh, as i previously mentioned and then uh, once that is done everything passes it takes about an year or so for any kind of fda approval or even more than two years or three years but you have to get your paperwork right uh, the last thing once your um, product is in the market you report the failures of your product at every stage if it happens uh, if your product is successful um, the success of a product is uh, decided when your product does not have any MDR on it and no medical device reporting. Um, recently, we had a recall of an XYZ company. We had to uh, uh, bring in, uh, uh, I think it was a dialysis machine of a company. I, I'm not sure in the US they had to do a recall because uh, the IFUs, the instruction for use were not legible. 
there was nothing wrong with the equipment. Uh, there was nothing wrong with the uh, uh, functioning of the equipment. There was nothing wrong with uh, the process or the procedure that the doctors or uh, the medical professionals uh, were operating that particular uh, dialysis machine on. But only because their instruction for use manual was not legibly printed it had some ink issues we had to recall the um uh the whole uh, equipments from the market uh that's called as medical device reporting you have to report every single thing that goes wrong with your um product right uh, that's pretty much it i have um I am open to questions. I think we have ton of time uh, to answer any kind of questions. I can see two questions. Um, okay, just one. <laughs> can I become a forensic engineer after doing biomedical? Yes, why not? Um, forensic is a very interesting field for uh, let's just talk about crime, right? Whenever uh, a crime happens, we collect DNA evidence. Um, uh, from the crime scene, you pick up fingerprints. Uh, from the crime scene, you collect photos, you collect blood spatter, you uh, analyze the way the blood has been splattered on the wall. Um, you can see the wound or uh, wound on the patient's body or a person who is dead and get to know the kind of um, uh, crime or the kind of weapon that's been used. Uh, so basically you need engineers who will process this information that is collected from a crime scene, not only from a crime scene, but also for uh, medical cases which we see happen uh, very rarely uh, so forensic engineer can uh, you can become a forensic engineer after doing biomedical how is master's public health after becoming biomedical engineering that's an awesome question um uh, not sure if i'm able to answer that 100 percent, but i have uh, seen uh, many of my friends who started off their career as a, a doctor who finished their uh, mbbs but took up masters in public health management and they're working with cdc right now trying to tackle um COVID situation so uh public health department needs people from biomedical engineering uh who can understand chemistry who can understand how equipment work um so basically the the answer is uh it's a very good and a noble um profession to be in as a public health so if you want to unmute, unmute yourself uh, and ask any questions, please feel free to do so. I think we have about 20 minutes more, if I am not sure, or four minutes more. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, four minutes. Okay, perfect. So we are on time. We are on time. Okay. Four minutes more, guys. Um, any questions? I am an electronics engineering um, bachelor graduate. I did my master's in industrial engineering where I didn't study anything about electronics. Um, but, oh, is there any scope after MS in medical electronics or like in microcontroller domain considering Moore's law? I do not remember what is Moore's law. I apologize, but, um, Instruments like uh, Penumbra's uh, real system that is uh, that uses that we use for uh, rehabilitation work on microcontrollers trying to grab uh, the sensation from your skin. Um, so I think there's huge, huge, huge scope of trying to make microcontrollers as compact as in size and uh, making sure they're compatible uh, within a human body. Can you tell me job searching process in abroad, like in US or UK after complaining 
Um, again, this is a career based question. I would appreciate if you reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn or even on a text on WhatsApp and we can talk more about it. Can we get a job directly after graduation abroad? Um, yes and no. Forensic engineer, uh, it depends on what your level of interest is and le level of passion to get a job uh, after you graduate, right? Um, and then uh, do forensic engineer have scope in India? There are a lot of, lots of scope. Uh, I'm not sure what. Uh, we can discuss it together and try to research it. Can other department engineers uh, eligible for working as a biomedical engineer? Um, yes, why not? We just talked about uh, if a mechanical engineer is working with a medical uh, device company, your title becomes a biomedical engineering, biomedical engineer in return. Uh, so it just depends on the nomenclature of the company uh, that they use. Uh, but yes, you can work as a biomedical engineer. Okay. Any other questions? Um, if there are no other questions, um, I would like to thank the faculty, um, the students, um, I did forget to grab the name of the students who put this whole thing together. Uh, appreciate the hard work that you have done. Uh, absolutely. I cannot send message because I'm not a member of this chat, but uh, my LinkedIn whole name is Shreya Kulali, S-H-R-E-Y-A, um, K-U-L-A-L-I. Uh, can find me, uh, there's PMP, uh, that's Professional Project Management uh, Certification. That's, um, I cannot post it since I cannot send a message, uh, but I'm pretty sure if you reach out to Geeta ma'am or I, I was in touch with Kinjal. Uh, thank you so much for all the help Kinjal, uh, I appreciate it. So if you can reach out to her, she'll be happy to uh, share my LinkedIn profile. Yes, I'll I think be we are. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kindle. So um, I think we are one minute over. Um, if, uh, in LinkedIn, if you just type Shreya Kulali, you are you are available. Yes, yes. My my profile is open, so you guys can get in touch with me. I was replying that way only. Others were asking me. Some of them are texting me and asking. So I told them you go and find out in LinkedIn only. Correct. Yes. Right. If, if faculty has anything to ask, uh, please feel free to ask. I'll try my best to answer it. Hello, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, there is quiz in the chat box. All the participants needs to attend the quiz and also need to fill the feedback form, which will be shared shortly. Awesome, you guys get a quiz. Um, I hope you guys were listening. Uh, do well on the quiz. My name is on stake. I hope I did good. They will do well. <laughs> yes, intelligent students, I, I know. The presentation very nicely. Yes. And I was noticing there are only 15 to 16 slides and you spoke for two hours. That is very important. I know, right? I spoke for two hours. Can you believe it? I, I'm surprised. I'm proud of myself for doing that. Um, I hope I did not. Uh, I hope I gave as much as information I could in those uh, uh, limited number of slides. Um, and I have much more to share. Uh, if given an opportunity, we'll come back and um, talk more about this.
I think anyone wants to take over. Ananya, I think you are running the show. Yes, ma'am. If anyone yep. has any doubt or questions, you can ask. Andhra, I have a question. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, on the behalf of BMESI and BMSA committees of VIT, I would like to thank you for taking out your time and for giving us such great insights of medical instruments, manufacturing and regulation, specifically about various recent medical innovations and also the regulation of medical devices. I am sure every participant has gained some new information about the various technologies involved in the manufacturing of medical devices and this session must have sparked some interest in this field. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, patience and guidance. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, now, I would like to call upon the convener of BMSA VIT, Professor Neelam Punjabi, ma'am, to give a word of thanks. Yes, thank you, Ananya. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I am Professor Neelam Punjabi. I am the convener of BMSA committee. It's an honor for me to give vote of thanks for our first event of this certificate course. Uh, on behalf of VIT, BMSA committee, BMSI committee, biomedical department, I want to thank Mrs. Shreya for sharing her knowledge with us today. I'm sure all the participants must have enjoyed, must have learned so much uh, today. Okay, uh, I could see from the chat box, there were so many interesting questions. Uh, thank you all the participants for joining us with us today. Uh, I would like to thank all the colleagues who have also joined uh, this event today. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Over to you, Ananya. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, I would like to say something. Thank you, Shreya. Actually, I was uh, I, I had called her husband for a talk last semester and she herself said I am also interested in giving. So I wanted to give an opportunity to her and then we were uh, just thinking about it. And then when the certificate course came and this was actually this is the apt first lecture for the certificate course and you have covered everything in the uh, in that title actually. We have to say that everything, every uh, aspect of the title is covered in your talk. It was a good begin. Thank you, Shreya, for uh, giving a good, nice Absolutely, talk. Sir. My, uh, it's my pleasure. Anything that I can help with the students. Um, we did not have this opportunity where our seniors could come in and talk to us about the fields that they were working in. And when I saw this opportunity, I'm like, heck yes, I am going to take this opportunity. I'm going to convey what I'm doing because uh, not many of the times what we study is something that we apply at work. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that we gain on the job. Our managers teach us, our colleagues teach us. So uh, it's a very interesting field, uh, something that you can give back to the community. And if I can share something back with these students that can spark the interest of taking up manufacturing, uh, amazing. But I would say we highly encourage uh, being a female uh, in a manufacturing field, we don't see many of the females. I am a uh, uh, single female running the show in a team of uh, men. Uh, I would highly encourage uh, females to take up manufacturing, get their hands dirty, uh, work with lathe machines, get some grease on your hand, put some um, hard bound shoes uh, that can protect your toes uh, go out in the manufacturing field make some pistons i made pistons uh, uh, just get there it's fun uh, you can do anything that uh, anyone does yeah right thank you and proud proud to be uh, part of it. yep um thank uh, yeah. Good night. Everyone. Good night, guys. Uh, yeah. Not good night. Have a good day um, and a good weekend. <laughs> I'm going to go sleep. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you, Thank you all you. for Thank taking you. your precious time out, ma'am, and attending this event. I hope to see you all in the further sessions of the series as well. 
participants, please stay tuned. Remember, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. Do not wait. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. You. We can do it. No problem. Prakusha Ananya, you are there. Prakusha and Ananya. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. there. Uh, Ananya, there seems to be uh, say uh, error with the form link. Okay, just uh, change the settings yes. so that all can respond. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are working on it. Yeah. Once that is done, then you share it in the WhatsApp group. And uh, one yes. more thing, the uh, the recording of the session, please. Uh, uh, upload it on our YouTube channel, and once that is done, you share the link with all the participants, those who are listed today. Yes. 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 Yes